Good morning and thank you for being with us on Road to Space. We are going live on the 20th mission of the Vega launcher. In 30 minutes, the European spacecraft will take off with three Sera satellites on board. That's the first European electromagnetic intelligence space space system. A pack. It's packed with high-end technologies and it's been developed by CNES for the General Directorate of Armament. But before that, Let's take a look at the agenda. So today in Road to Space, an outstanding lift off the Vega flight, uh, Flight 20, that will take off in a few minutes from the European Space Center in Kourou. So we're live in Kourou, but also in Paris with our experts. With them, we will decide for takeoff, and you will learn more about the passengers on board the launcher. Three satellites. Yes, we have three satellites that will fly on two different orbital planes to design a triangle geometry. Ceres is the only electromagnetic signal uh, intelligence system, a revolution uh, for our armed forces, 20 years of research between CNES and the Ministry of the Armed Forces. A launch is always a moment full of emotions for the team. In our live show, new reports on how these satellites were designed and also information about the ground segment. This is the special room for the satellite. Welcome to Road to Space, the show where the present is connected to the future. So today in Road to Space, we have reports for you, but also experts with three uh, guests on our set. Samuel Rogers, you are uh, with us, your specialist uh, Vega for Aryan Space. You are going to help us decipher the features and the challenges of this mission. And then later, we will have uh, Hervé Grandjean, speaker, spokesperson for the Ministry of the, of Defence, and Philip Steininger, the Defence Advisor for CNES. But right now, let's. Uh, see where the, what they're doing in Kourou. We have all the teams from Iron Space, CNES, DGA, Airbus, Defense and Space, and the European State Space Agency. They're red, getting ready for liftoff. But we are going to be able to talk to Stefan Israel. Hello, Stefan. Welcome to Road to Space. Good morning. Thank you for being with us. It's very early in Kourou. It's um, not 6 o'clock a.m. I see all the teams ready in the Jupiter room. Uh, can you t give us some information about this launch that we're all waiting for? Yeah. So this is a very important launch. The CERES uh, program includes three satellites, as we just said. It's a program that we operate for the Ministry of Defense, along with the General Directorate for Armament. So it's a sovereign program, and it combines Airbus, Defense, and Spain with, with Thales and Thales Alenia space. So it's a French team that came together for a strategic program. So very important passengers, very important partners, you know them well. Can you tell us a bit more about today's flight? Yeah, it's a bit more than 6 o'clock a.m. in Guyana. At 6.27, our light launcher, Vega, is going to lift off. This mission is going to last 56 minutes and 44 seconds. It's uh, uh, to, to the north. We have the first uh, stages that will uh, separate, and then we'll have the Avum that will have two boosts. And, and at 700 kilometers in altitude, after 56 minutes and 44 seconds, we'll have the jettisoning of the satellite. It's not my first launch, and each time, whether for you or for us, it's always a great uh, source of satisfaction. But this flight is a bit special, isn't it? Yes. Uh, it's a lot of satisfaction, a lot of concentration, and it's uh, full of round figures tonight. It's flight 20, and it's the 300th flight launch from the Kourou in French Guiana. 
from all our family of launches, Ariane, Soyuz, and now Vega. So that's the 20th Vega flight and the th 300th flight from Kourou. OK, thank you very much, uh, Stéphane. We give you time to focus, and we'll get back to you a bit later. So of course, we'll be in touch with Kourou all along this uh, flight so that we can follow every single step of the launch, lift off at 10, 27, 55 seconds, to be very accurate. And we see that all the teams are very focused in Jupiter. Samuel Rogers, you are the Vega specialist for Aryan space. You're very familiar with the place. You went there. So what? Well, it's always very emotional, you know. I uh, usually take part to launches in the bunker. So that's the location that's the closest to the launch pad. So you're not in the Jupiter room. No, there are many teams. Some of them are in the Jupiter room. I was in the bunker, in the launch uh, bunker. So we are very near, but we are sheltered underground. And we feel everything related to the uh, launch. So that's uh, great. OK, what do you feel when you get there? There is a combination of many different emotions. There is some level of stress because we do realize that it's a beautiful human and technical endeavor that brings us to the launch pad. So we can't afford to neglect any detail. So there is a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. But there is also very high concentration. Everybody knows exactly what they have to do. So everybody is very much focused and very much involved. And as Stefan said, there is also great joy when we see that this is, well, the end of several weeks or months of work for all the persons involved in such a uh, takeoff. OK, so before we take part in this uh, la live takeoff, we are back in Kourou with Marino Fragnito. Are you with us, Marino? Yes, I am with you. Hello, Marino. You are director of the Vega business unit at Ariane Space. But this is a non-traditional, non-typical mission. Why? Well, this is a mission on which we've worked for many, many years. As uh, Stefan just said, it was very much teamwork coordinated by Ariane Space, but also involving CNES, DGA, Airbus, Airbus Spain, that helped us build the uh, jettisoning system for the satellites. We worked together for many years. We carried out many verifications during the development phase because we have a jettisoning system, which we call a CLIP, and that's very specific for Ceres. And we also worked uh, in the avionics that were developed specifically for this mission. So we have a very narrow uh, separation margins for the satellite. So we had to check that very accurately during the development phase. That was very accurate work for all our teams. And we're all there, very focused for the success of this mission tonight. OK, so it's highly technical. How can you prepare for such a technical mission? What's different? Well, as I said, the system is um, to uh, jettison the satellite is uh, optimized. Um, I will tell you more about the mission during the show, but we have a network of uh, telemetry stations, which is not the standard uh, uh, network. We have a boat that will acquire telemetry data along the path of the uh, launch of the launcher. So we've uh, uh, accumulated various uh, requirements that were complied with through the setting of non-standard systems. And all this required huge efforts on behalf of our in space and of our teams. Well, thank you very much, Marino. We'll be back with Samuel. Uh, we're back with Samuel to talk about all this. We talked about a boat. We talked about uh, a sea-based telemetry station. So this is an outstanding mission for all the teams. You're our expert uh, tonight. Can you tell us uh, the specificities of this flight? It won't follow the same trajectory. We have an animation. Can you comment this? 
and I learn a lot. So we should have a video animation and you'll be able to make comments on every single face. Yeah. So it's going to be a launch from the uh, Guyana Space Center. It will be triggered with the ignition of the P-80. That's the first uh, propulsion stage of the Vega launch launcher. It will push for 10 minutes and then there will be a separation order and the stage will be separated. Then uh, the launcher will be uh, pushed by the second stage called the Z-23 and it will uh, burn and then be separated. And then the Zephyro 9 will be in charge of pushing the launcher. This is what we see now on, on the screen. Zephyro 9 will work for a bit more than two minutes. And during this phase, this is where when we jettisoned the fairing that protected the three satellites when the launcher was going through the atmosphere. And that's when we have acquisition by the boat-based telemetry station that Marino just talked about. Yes, we'll talk about this some more later. Okay. And with this boat base station, we will know in real time about all the events that will come afterwards. So I'm talking about the separation of the third stage, the Zephyro 9, as you can see. That's a slightly specific maneuver to separate this stage. And then the first ignition of the upper stage, the Avum, that's a very special um, uh, stage because it works with uh, uh, liquid propellants. And then we'll have a ballistic phase that will take us above Australia. That's when the Avon will be ignited for the second time. Then it will be extinguished. And that's when we'll have the jettisoning of the three Ceres satellite. As Marino said, it's a bit specific because we have to release or jettison the three satellites at the same time. And all this will last 50 minutes, roughly. And then we have a last ballistic phase that will take us above Canada. And that's when we will have a last ignition of the Avum to decrease the altitude of the remaining part of the launcher and finish the uh, VV-20 mission. Thank you very much for all this explanation. We will see that live in a minute, and we are connected with Kuhu, and we will remain connected to all the very precious information that you will hear from Pépin Antoine Guillaume, the uh, operations director known as the DDO. And I'm delighted to hear that this DDO was Pépin Antoine Guillaume. And in a few minutes, he is going to announce the final countdown. But behind me, we have this green board. Can we say a few words about this green board, Samuel? We all keep an eye on it, don't we? Yes, we can say a few words about this. This board shows the status of every subsystem required for a successful launch. So here, everything is green. So that's very good news. It's a bit like for traffic lights. When it's green, you can go. When it's red, you have to stop. So we all agree if there was one line that was to move to red, we would stop uh, the final countdown. Yes, absolutely. So at the bottom, we see weather. Is it important? Yes, we have four categories of information that we need for the launch. So at the top left, you have everything related to the base. Bottom left, this is the connection with the launcher, telemetry, geolocation, etc. Then, bottom, top right, it's everything relating to the passengers. And bottom right, you have the weather. And of course, we do monitor all kind of weather-related risks like thunder, lightnings, etc. So everything's green. We had the latest weather forecast a few minutes ago. OK. so. We took a look at this uh, board, but before we reached the green light, we had the whole campaign, and we have a video that shows that everything starts on water. Absolutely. Yes, because most uh, parts of the launcher 
arrive by sea. So they're offloaded in Kuhu, then they're driven to the uh, CSG. The first stage, the P-80, arrives first with a mobile platform. It's uh, placed on the launch pad. It's hoisted and placed in the mobile gantry. That's the second stage. Zephyro 23, which is hoisted on top of the P-80 and then integrated. So we uh, make this assembly of uh, stages. Then the Zephyro 9 is hoisted in the building and integrated on the Zephyro 23. Then we have the Avum that comes in a container and then it's integrated on top of the Zephyro 9. For the satellites, they arrive in dedicated containers and they are prepared in specific buildings. We're talking about white rooms, aren't we? Yes, under controlled atmosphere. Absolutely. And there is a certain number of operations that are required, like filling them up with uh, fuel, for instance. And then we have mechanical and electrical checks before they are placed on what we call the clip. That's the special platform for these satellites. Then the fairing is put in place. The fairing is going to protect them for the next phase and for crossing the atmosphere. And that's the upper composite. The upper composite is then placed on a mobile platform. It's hoisted at the very top of the launcher. It's integrated on the AVM. That all these um, are very uh, specialized missions, but our teams are trained. Then we remove the gantry and the launcher is ready for launch on the launch pad. Thank you very much indeed. Let's take a look at what there is in the upper part. Ceres. Ceres is a technological challenge, but also an industrial challenge the result of many years of research and experiments that were carried out with DGA and CNES. And that's great because as you were commenting the video, we have Hervé Grandjean, spokesperson for the Ministry of Defense. Hello, hello. And alongside with you, Philip Steininger, a defense advisor to CNES CEO. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Now, together, we are going to try and understand the issues and challenges of today's mission. I'll start with you, Philip Steininger. You work at CNES. You are the uh, military advisor of its CEO. What are the links between the space and defense sectors? Well, first, there is a very strong historical link. And today, we can only uh, see that there are two facts, uh, space programs and activities, or at least most of them have a dual applications, both civil and military applications, and also the defense of our societies today comes from the space, and the space cannot not be defended either. So uh, I could say that there is no defense without space, but no space without defense nowadays. And of course, Hervé Grandjean, I'm going to also ask you to tell us more about the use of these satellites in the future field of defense, uh, what is going to be their use? Well, satellites are absolutely necessary to carry out military operations. Let me give you an example. In April 2018, we launched an operation to strike the chemical plants used by Ashar el-Assad. To do such a mission, you need, in advance, intelligence pictures of the precise locations of these uh, plants. And that's why we use military observation satellites to obtain these pictures. And when you start the air attack with uh, jet fighters that take off from the Saint-Dizier air base. You have a constant radio connection with the pilots thanks to military telecommunication satellites, the Syracuse satellites. And once the missiles are launched, they are guided by geocommunication satellites. So you see that you cannot carry out a big military operation nowadays without uh, this uh, capability. So it's important to use what's above our heads. Now, let's immediately watch a video in which we're going to explain to you how the intelligence capabilities of the armed forces in the field depend upon the satellites. 
France has uh, launched into the uh, space conquest from the beginning of the 60s. Since then, military space programs are national priority for observation, telecommunications, and many technologies have been born thanks to the industrial and technological efforts supported by the Ministry of the Armed Forces. The new uh, space uh, strategy for defense is increasing these capabilities and enables France to have some of the best uh, space assets in the world. Now, there are uh, systems in Europe that detect from uh, the space, Ceres, uh, to have the uh, capability for uh, space-based electronic signals intelligence program. It complements other existing sensors. So Ceres uh, uh, is about 700 kilometers high to access areas that are not accessible by other land-based uh, conventional sensors. You have a better knowledge of the enemy operational capability and also so the possibility to uh, develop electromagnetic uh, countermeasures. If you know the enemy radars, you can optimize the trajectory of the air attacks. And these capabilities are implemented by the High uh, uh, Space Command under the authority of the Joint Chief of Staff to conduct military operations, which is at the core of French defense. CRS is a constellation of three military satellites rotating around the Earth at about 700 kilometers kilometers uh, that can collect data everywhere in the world in a, a very populated area or not. Uh, radars uh, transmit electromagnetic signals that are picked up by Ceres satellites and they are used to produce intelligence. It is the simultaneous use of the three satellites information that makes it possible to locate the transmitter. When a radar transmits a signal, the three satellites don't get it at the same time but with a slight gap and it's by cross checking the data collected by the three satellites that it's possible to accurately locate the transmitter. The data, once they are analyzed, can provide the technical characteristics of the radar. This precious information is used by the Demeter information system that provides sophisticated intelligence to really identify the uh, transmitter. CRS is an incredible technological adventure. It is DGA that has uh, developed this uh, unique system in Europe in cooperation with the armed forces, CNES, and industry. To develop this system, we've had to really uh, take up a lot of uh, challenges. It's a real technical prowess, and we made progress step by step thanks to four demonstrators to test the orbits. The first demonstrators, Cerise and Clementine, showed that it was possible to detect radars from space, and the next one, ASA and ELISA helped us develop new technologies that will enable Ceres to characterize and locate uh, accurately all types of transmitters, and that's how the Ceres program could be launched in 2015. This was done under the leadership of uh, DGA in partnership with the armed forces, CNES and Airbus and Thales. All these demonstrators validated all the technologies that are on embarked in Ceres today in uh, near area like France. Hundreds of transmitter Transmit simultaneously all types of radars, airport radars for uh, air traffic control, uh, weather forecast uh, radars, maritime uh, radars. So we need a, a super sensitive system to detect all these types of transmitters and characterize and locate all of these uh, uh, radars. So this is uh, really important uh, uh, to have Ceres and uh, all these electronic components uh, to uh, really process a lot of information at the same time. Another challenge with CRS is formation flight. Another prowess uh, achieved thanks to CNES, and uh, they are responsible for the ground segment and also for station keeping. In order to obtain these performances, the, you have two very uh, uh, close uh, orbital planes, and the satellites are injected simultaneously by the launcher on these two planes with specific maneuvers that require several months of uh, work. After that, the um, satellites are maintained precisely in this configuration. So it's an industrial and technological prowess, the result of all the investments made for years by the Ministry of the Armed Forces, which increases considerably the ability of our forces to collect intelligence on uh, theaters of operations and to enable France to take better decisions. Thank you.
uh, in a few minutes, we're going to uh, discuss CRS again. But during the story, we heard the DDO announcing the beginning of the countdown 45 seconds ago. So what's going on? Yes, he confirmed the beginning of the countdown. It's an important step because it's the beginning of the last phase that prepares liftoff and is going to give its autonomy to the launcher. Status panel, all right? Yes, everything is green. I want to ask you a question about the satellites. Can we talk about spy satellites? Well, intelligence satellites. Until now, we could take pictures of the Earth with our CSO military satellites. With Ceres satellites, now we would be able to capture electromagnetic transmissions. Why is that important? Well, when you want to collect intelligence and find out what type of ship is uh, in the China Sea or the Mediterranean Sea, we listen to the uh, waves uh, produced by uh, the ships uh, you are monitoring, and they are specific to every type of equipment. A uh, uh, Russian ship is not uh, like uh, a Chinese uh, radar or uh, an Iranian one. And when we compare this data, we'll be able to know exactly what ship and nationality we are dealing with. And before that, we didn't know that. We had no satellites to listen to that, not in the electromagnetic field. We only had demonstrators, prototypes. We were training. We were testing these technologies. But we were not using them in our military operations with Ceres. As of next year, we will be able to use the intelligence from Ceres to, uh, for our operations in the field. So it's a major change. Now, let's... Uh uh, refocus on the launch, but before we had to ask this information from our neighbors beforehand. Yes, we could cooperate with allied countries. Now we'll be completely autonomous and sovereign. The France is, is uh, in the uh, five first countries worldwide to have this type of uh, capability. Uh, it's reassuring. We are one minute and 23 seconds from liftoff. We're going to hear the DDO uh, announcing the final countdown in a few seconds. That's why one minute before launch, right? Absolutely. So what is mean? Well, uh, less than one minute. And it makes it possible to prepare all the teams to the uh, most important uh, seconds. Uh, zero minus one minute. So it's the period during which everybody is very concentrated. So let's watch and uh, see the launch. And uh, then uh, we'll talk together again. We see Vega on the uh, uh, launch pad in Kuru 45 seconds before liftoff. Now, it's always a very important uh, moment for the uh, teams and even for us on the uh, set. Now, let's watch and listen. Tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. Dix, neuf, huit, sept, six, cinq, quatre, trois, deux, un, stop. Allumage P80 et décollage. Nominal, le guidage est nominal. Paramètres bord sont normaux. These are impressive images. I'm always impressed and it's incredible to see that full daylight, no clouds today. It's absolutely wonderful. The Vega launch has been flying for 45 seconds. So acquisition by the Saint-Jean station, and that's the 12th launch for the year for Ariane Space, a perfect launch so far. So we've just heard acquisition by Saint-Jean. What does this mean? It's a telemetry station based in the west of Guyana, and as the launcher is in altitude thanks to the P-80 uh, stage, we have acquisition by this station. Uh, so that we have contact with the launcher for the first phase of the flight. The P-80 is the first stage, okay. And in 40 seconds, it will be separated from the rest of the launcher. Yes, it's active for two minutes, roughly. And once it's finished its uh, boost and it's empty, we 
separated. OK, so it's very fast. Yes, it takes off very fast because we have 230 tons of thrust that's delivered by the P-80. And you have to look at this in relation to the weight of the launcher, which is uh, twice as low. So it's an impressive uh, thrust, and the launcher takes off very fast. Yeah, these were impressive uh, images. You can see here the separation of the P-80. It's been confirmed. And we see that the Zephyro 23. Look at the P-23, that the P-80 that we can see. And now we have the Z-23 that uh, continues the thrusting. Why several stages? Why several engines? Well, the principle is to get rid of dead weight when you don't need it anymore. So when a stage is over and has consumed all its propellants, if we keep it on board, we carry dead weight in space, in space and that's costly. So that's why we have different stages in a launcher, so that we can get rid of dead weight as we go. The trajectory is nominal, says the DDO. It's incredible. After two minutes, we can still see uh, the launcher. Yes, it's normal. We are, we've gained an altitude, but uh, we're still a not far from Kourou in terms of uh, geography. But soon now, we will have acquisition from our next monitoring station in 20 seconds. OK, that's the end of thrust by Z23. That's coming to an end. And we will have the separation of the second stage. OK, we see the Jupiter room live. So next steps. So now we have roughly now in a few seconds, we have the separation of the third stage and the ignition of the Zephyro 9 engine. It's been confirmed and separation, jettisoning of the fairing. So these are computer-generated images. But say a few words about the fairing. Why a fairing? What's the role of a fairing? It protects the satellites when the launch goes across the atmosphere, because well, it, this trajectory generates uh, acoustic forces and, and many different things. And by the way, it also protects uh, the satellites from the uh, natural environment in French Guiana. But once we are uh, across the atmosphere, uh, we can jettison the fairing because once again, that's dead weight. And as we're no longer in the atmospheric layer, there is no friction anymore, so the satellites no longer need to be protected. Absolutely, that's correct. DDO said nominal, everything's nominal, so everything's fine. Let's say a few words about what we talked briefly earlier. Tell us about the trajectory, which is slightly more eastward than usually. Why? Well, it has to do with the orbit that we target for the Ceres satellite. It's inclined with regards to the equator. So to target this plane, we have to launch slightly more eastward than in the other Vega missions where we uh, where we launch to the north. But here we uh, launch slightly more to the east. OK, so that's a different trajectory leading to special measures. Everything's nominal. Yeah, keep an eye on what the DDO is saying. But the launcher is connected to the ground and to different telemetry bases. And here, we have one very special telemetry base, which is on board a ship. Yes, absolutely. Because of the trajectory, because we have to launch to the east, at one stage, we're flying over the North Atlantic. And we have no station available on ground to ensure contact with the launcher. That's why, for this mission, we deployed, like we did for other uh, launchers, we deployed a boat-based uh, station. So that's a boat that's in a very specific location that's ready to acquire all the signals from the launcher and to maintain connection with the launcher during this phase 
across the Atlantic Ocean. So we can see that on the animation. Z9, Zephyro 9 separation has just been conf confirmed. OK, that's another very important phase. We have a 40, 50 minutes, right? Yeah, we have uh, 40 minutes left. We have a reorientation maneuver before we have the ignition of the upper stage. OK, this upper stage contains our three passengers. Yes, absolutely. Reorientation maneuver. Why? Because for the uh, separation of the third stage, we give it an angle in order to make sure that there is a proper injection. So the uh, uh, orientation maneuver has just been confirmed. Can we talk about this AVUM stage? What does AVUM mean? And what is it? Well, it's a, a different stage. It's liquid propellant. So I ju we just had confirmation that it was ignited, so everything's fine. The AVEM, you are connected directly live with Kuro. Yeah, maybe I should have said it before. OK, so the AVEM is very specific because the propellants are liquid propellants, and we can ignite it at various moments. So it gives us lots of uh, flexibility so that we can target different orbits and unlike the other stages, which you can't switch on and switch off, here we can. OK, we will talk about CNES if you don't mind, Philip uh, Steininger. CNES celebrating its 60th anniversary. Absolutely. Next month we will celebrate the 60th anniversary of CNES. OK, so it's not a secret. We met already, you and I, and we met with you at CNES in order to talk about the history of CNES and how it started working in the space industry. A few days ago, one of our journalists went to Paris at the CNES headquarters in order to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the French Space Agency. He met with two of the major pillars of CNES, Lionel Suchet, the general executive manager, and Philippe Steininger, who is the defense advisor to the CEO. Hello, Lionel Suchet. Hello. What's uh, CNES mission? We have several missions because we are the French space agency, so we have a double hat. We're an agency and we're a technical center. That makes a difference between us and many space agencies throughout the world, but that's an asset for us. We are there to imagine the future of the space industry, to imagine actions to develop the space industry in France and to develop the uh, space ecosystem in France. So what's the role of CNES at international level? Level. We have a long tradition of international cooperation in the space industry. Space is very important in terms of diplomacy, and today we cooperate. We have partnership agreement with more than 70 countries. So we see that space is increasingly important. More and more people are interested, and we are always in touch with these people. And it's part of our DNA to be part of the, of the project right from the inception. Okay. Okay, we are going to celebrate the 60th anniversary. Do you have key dates to share with us? Well, every single employee at CNES has their key dates, but I'm here to tell you about uh, the setting up of CNES 60 years ago. And then four years later, the first launch that uh, made it possible for France to become the third space power in the world, capable of orbiting a passenger with its own launcher. That was on the 26th of November, 1960 and that was the Asterix satellite, a very French name indeed, with the Diamant launcher from the Amagir base in Algeria. So that was the very beginning of uh, the uh, space uh, journey for France. We, had, we started from scratch. We had no space industry, no scientists working in space. No one knew how to build a satellite or a launcher, but the Army was interested. We worked with them, and we set up the first research labs, the first uh, 
products. We did lots of things in-house because nothing existed. And then, little by little, the industry ramped up their expertise. And today, we have the ecosystem that we all know. Today, we're all focused on the CSG, the Vienna Space Center. When was it open? It was in 1964. We had not yet launched the Asterix satellite in 1965, but we were already preparing our future base. And on the 24th of December 1979, that was the first launch for Ariane, that was Ariane 1. And then we had the great saga of Ariane flights. You know that we've launched 255 Ariane launches so far. Then June 1982, we launched from Baikonur, and that was the first European to fly in, pla in space, Jean-Luc Chrétien, a French uh, as, uh, cosmonaut, and we have great expertise in manned flight at CNES. In 1986, Spot 1, the first satellite for the Spot series to observe the Earth, and there again it was a highly innovative satellite back then, and in the field of expertise of CNES. So 60 years of presence in the industry for CNES, Thank you so much for your time. Philip Steininger, can you tell us about the major steps between, uh, for the cooperation between CNES and the Army? CNES was set up 60 years ago, and right at the inception, we, we, there was a desire for, for CNES to be very much involved in military affairs. We wanted France to be a, 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 a space power, but all for, for civilian applications, but we also wanted uh, ballistic missiles for our uh, nuclear uh, power. So the uh, public authorities were convinced of the usefulness of space and of a strong connection between space and national defense. So CNES is a key player in our national defense. Yes, in our space national defense for the monitoring of space, for uh, conducting space military programs, and, and CNES paves the way for the future, for future operations in space. It also controls the military satellites that evolve in low Earth orbit, and it supports the ramping up of uh, the armed forces in the space area. What can you reveal about major programs in the future? Well, CNES is involved in developing the future generation of satellites, for, and in the coming years, CNES is going to continue working in close cooperation with uh, the uh, French Air, Air Command. Space Command. Thank you. So, Philip Steininger, so what about watching this video and so, tell us a few words about this uh, long journey. Yes, it was a long journey, but we can only pay tribute to the decision made by our politicians 60 years ago. They decided to turn France into a space nation and Within a few years, it became a reality, as in 1965, we launched our first French satellite, and this in total autonomy. And I'd like to underline the constant effort of polit political authorities in favor of space, meaning that France is one of the key players in, uh, in space at the moment. Okay, so that's your anniversary. There will be an anniversary for DGA as well. Coming back to you, Samuel Rogers, where do we stand? As we were watching the video, I think there was a notification that uh, we have uh, data from Santa Maria station in the Esson. Yes, so we are in the north of Atlantic of the Atlantic Ocean. That's the end of the Avum phase. Uh, the Avum uh, engine or stage should be turned off in one minute. So, yes, in less than one minute, we'll have the extinction of the Avum uh, stage. It will be reignited a bit later. OK, and what's coming up after? OK, so the switching off of the Avum has just been confirmed. I heard it. Confirmation, extinction of the Avum stage. OK, and after that? Well, after that, we have a long phase taking us all the way above Australia. We'll have no stage ignited anymore. We'll be just flying 
all the way to Australia. Okay, the announcement that was made said that there is loss of contact with Santa Maria. Sorin, we are in, in the dark. Yes, we are, but it's all normal. It's nominal. That's something that we know. We expected that. The launcher is going to follow its trajectory, and it will continue taking measurements, recording various parameters, but instead of sending the signal to ground stations, this is stored on board, and this will be collected by the next station, which will be New Norcia in Australia. That's when we will collect all this data. So we just have to wait uh, and wait till the time we are above Australia in 10 minutes. Okay, so we talked about the 60th anniversary of CNES, and this year there is another anniversary, that's DGA. We also have a short uh, newsreel, and then we will come back to you for this next stage. Hervé Grandjean, back to you. You are the spokesman of the Ministry of the Armed Forces, and since the beginning of this program, we've been talking about the involvement of DGA in Ceres. We know the Armed Forces, but not so much DGA. It's uh, the General Directorate for Armaments, the French Procurement Agency. What does it mean? 10,000 people working for the Ministry of the Armed Forces. Let me give you a comparison. When you want to build a house, you know you want three bedrooms, a big living room, and a bathroom. So you ask an architect to uh, make uh, drawings and to organize the work with artisans, uh, masons, electricians, etc. DJ is this architect. We manage all major, or they manage all major programs, except they don't build houses, but uh, fighter aircraft, uh, ships, uh, nuclear submarines, etc. And they provide a connection between the military who say, I need a satellite, an aircraft, a ship, and the industries that build them. So very often, uh, that's uh, with CNES, uh, like today, of course, uh, big links with CNES. Uh, of course, DGA uh, collects all the military requirements and listens to the forces about what they want to do in the field, which, what type of uh, armaments, and then they draft specifications, which is what uh, industry is going to manufacture, and then they will work with uh, big industrial groups and SMEs as well, and uh, write the contract, negotiate, say what they need, and uh, obtain the equipment before delivering it to the armed forces. So it's a collaboration between the military, the soldiers who uh, wage war, and industries that uh, make the equipment. So DJ is in Ballard, in Paris, but also in many test centers. We have about 10 test centers with highly qualified engineers that work in these test centers. If you go to know close to Paris, there are people who uh, draw the propellers of our nuclear submarines in Angers. People test new armored vehicles on uh, special tracks to make sure that the equipment that will then be used by the soldiers in operations uh, meets its performances. And you have a specialized center in Toulouse as well, yeah? absolutely specialized in uh, uh, airspace uh, uh, now. Why Toulouse? 
I know why, because, uh, well, there are many of you working with space. Well, Toulouse is the beating heart of the uh, uh, space uh, business, uh, and we decided to locate the Space Command in Toulouse when we decided to set up this uh, uh, defense space strategy. We know that satellites are important for this strategy. What we haven't said is that space is becoming a conflict area nowadays. Spies are trying to listen to our satellites. They are. Uh, firings against satellites that create debris, and that happened very recently. Uh, yesterday, there was maybe a Russian uh, uh, firing uh, destroying a satellite. So it's very uh, uh, topical. So space is becoming a field of conflicts, and we need to prepare to wage war in space. That's why we have prepared a uh, space defense strategy, which includes uh, developing equipment, uh, nano satellites, etc. But also, there is an operational aspect. How do you get organized to wage war in space? So that's why we've uh, set up a, a space uh, command that will be located in Toulouse and coordinate with CNES. There is Thales as well and many SMEs. And uh, there will be uh, a coordination uh, there. And uh, it's Toulouse uh, where all this is happening. That's why it was so important for us to locate it there. So uh, I s met you at CNES in Paris, but you're also based in Toulouse. Can you explain the role of CNES? You don't only work for uh, defense, uh, but you've had a long collaboration with them. Yes, CNES is a uh, public uh, establishment with an industrial and commercial uh, uh, aspect, and uh, its role is to uh, propose space policies to the government, and once it's approved by the government, CNES implements this space policy, which uh, leads us to having many activities, scientific ones, in defense activities, but also special uh, space applications as well uh, that take us very far, and that's why CNES is under the uh, leadership of different uh, ministries, the one in charge of space, in charge of research, and the one in charge of defense, the Ministry of the Armed Forces, which shows a very wide uh, uh, scope of activities. So what is uh, each of these organizations' role? Is there a uh, uh, manager? Are you involved in operational matters? Yes, CNES has three main areas of intervention for the benefit of, of uh, defense. The first one is uh, that we uh, conduct major space military programs. Uh, second one is preparation of the future. The third one is more operational oriented. It's uh, the surveillance of space. Uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, space operations. And the fifth one is to provide support uh, to the armed forces to help them uh, ramp up their capabilities in the field of space. Because as was mentioned before, we've uh, started developing a new space strategy in uh, 2019 in the field of defense. The first four areas I've mentioned are traditional uh, uh, CNES serving uh, the defense. But the fifth one is uh, newer to help uh, set up this uh, space defense strategy. Now, regarding today's mission, uh, CNES is uh, in charge of an important uh, mission uh, for Ceres, which is the formation flight. That's important, yes, it's important for us, yes. Uh, well, there are three satellites flying in formation, but once we've uh, designed and developed the uh, equipment in partnership with the Ministry of the Armed Forces at NES, we need to guide these satellites. Uh, till now, it was NES operators that did it, but now we want military uh, men to also guide these satellites because they will be involved in military missions. So it's a joint mission, and again, we thank NES uh, to help the Ministry of the Armed Forces in this activity. But in the future, the Ceres satellites will be uh, led by mixed uh, teams. And that's a very interesting idea. You don't imagine that you need to uh, pilot satellites. Uh, they fly in formation. We're going to uh, watch a video to understand uh, how these three satellites are going to fly in formation and understand better in this video. 
It's a major development on which the CNES engineers have been working for many years to multiply the performances, push the limits. It was a big challenge because the future of many uh, Earth orbit missions and also more remote orbits are based on formation flight. In Toulouse, Paula and Geraldine are heading the departments that have uh, provided this technical development. Formation flight involves a number of satellites that are flying at a very close distance. Now we can uh, make a difference between different formation flights. Some of them uh, involve a series of satellites that can have different designs that are scattered on the same orbit uh, but not close. It's called a trade for Ceres. You have three satellites flying on two different orbital plans and that uh, constitute a specific geometry triangle that you need to maintain throughout the mission. You could mix up formation and constellation. The difference is that the constellation involves a series of satellites that cover uh, the Earth at a, a given moment. In a formation flight, you have a local coverage of the Earth at a given time. Satellites are the last part of a very uh, wide project that started with the uh, orbiting of the first demonstrator of Ceres. Uh, it was launched in 2004 and deorbited in 2010. CNES uh, for formation flights uh, started studying that a long time ago with uh, research and technology studies, and that led to the first project, the ESA, Beehive Project, a formation of four microsats in the Myriad uh, series, 120 kilos. Uh, it was simple, a formation with distances of a few hundreds of kilometers. It was a precursor of Ceres and the beginning of formation flights. This adventure is continuing in 2011 with ELISA. ELISA was uh, the next demonstrator uh, before Ceres. It was also a formation of four myriads, but uh, the formation flight was a bit closer, more accurate. We are in the process of deorbiting them because their big brother, Ceres, is now arriving. It was a demonstrator that was very useful for formation flights and uh, keeping Elisa in uh, uh, its uh, station. It was very good for the Ceres mission, but also to test the instruments that showed their very good uh, capacities. What was important in ESA and Elisa, uh, the precursors of Ceres, was the ability to demonstrate the performances, of course, uh, the uh, life cycle, uh, and what uh, we could achieve with uh, such a formation. These two uh, demonstrators made it possible to strengthen up the requirements of the Ceres program in terms of formation flight. The satellites are now closer, and the geometry is maintained in a more accurate way. Flying satellites in formation is a very difficult exercise, and it is the result of long years of R&D work by the CNES engineers. The challenges uh, that Ceres uh, is posing after the two demonstrators, Esa and Elisa, are as follows. We could ask ourselves why three satellites. We saw uh, that uh, a formation is uh, very uh, interesting, especially for electromagnetic intelligence, because it locates targets in the ground. So you use the principle of triangulation. You need three satellites to implement this principle of triangulation and locate the sources precisely. So in Ceres, we have three satellites in formation on two planes, uh, the east and west plans, uh, uh, compared with the demonstrator of course, they are bigger, more accurate, closer. It's true that the technical challenge was uh, the ability throughout uh, the uh, duration of the mission, which is quite long, to maintain this uh, specific geometry that is absolutely necessary for the mission to be successful and to achieve the performances you, you want. That's why this uh, technical challenge uh, must uh, take into account robustness and all the uh, uh, dangers uh, that may happen uh, to one, two, or three of the satellites in the formation. This uh, formation uh, flight technology provides better uh, accuracy in location, which is a major progress for mastery of the space.
Uh, we were talking about uh, something when we were watching the video. We'll get back to the name you give to satellites, because that must be fun to understand. But let's refocus on this fo formation flight. Uh, so, Philip, sorry, but we're talking about autonomous cars today, and all of a sudden, everything, everybody thinks it's amazing to have satellites flying in formation. Why is it complex? Well, before it's complex, it's a must. This Ceres system is going to be able to locate an electromagnetic radar on the surface of the Earth thanks to a triangulation technique. So each of these satellites will receive electromagnetic waves from the ground with a small gap in time and via triangulation they will calculate the positioning on the Earth. So the outcome of the measurement will be all the more accurate when uh, we can maintain the formation. And this is where CNES engineers are very important indeed, because for systems like that, keeping the formation flight is not in an easy task. In the low orbit, there are many different parameters that prevent uh, a satellite from keeping its injection trajectory. What kind of parameters? Well, the influence of the moon, of the planets, of the sun, of residual friction coefficients, and the shape of the Earth, which is not a perfect sphere, and possibly avoidance maneuvers that we have to carry out in order to avoid debris or all the orbital stations, which could be on our trajectory. Yes, and uh, we just heard about a um, missile being shot in space, so we have to avoid collisions. Absolutely. So we will have to readjust this uh, formation to make sure that the calculated uh, geometry is maintained. And that's technically difficult, and I want to insist on the efficacy that needs to be uh, present at all time, because each time we will use the propulsion system of each individual satellite, so we will use fuel, and this has an impact on the overall life of the system. So the efficiency of these maneuvers is obviously of crucial importance. So once again, uh, what's important in satellite is the fuel that satellites have on board. We can't refill satellites when they are in orbit, so we have to have a very accurate piloting of these satellites. Okay, so we said it's triangulation. It's a bit like on the ground when you try and geolocate a, a mobile phone. But on, oper from an operational perspective, can you tell us more? Well, I can't really tell you more because that's classified, but a, a Ceres satellite looks over a 3,000 square kilometers area on the Earth. And when we receive an, an emission, we have to define where the sensor is, and that's the role of the two other satellites. We have sensors at the moment. To, we have planes that uh, give us intelligence. We have buildings that are listening in with big ears. But the as with these satellites, well, first, they are not easy to detect. We need an enemy power to be able to monitor space and see that the satellites are flying above their um, country. And the other intelligence devices are limited in range of action because there are national borders which we cannot violate. But space belongs to everybody, so we can go there and we can watch the entire planet with these satellites, and that's uh, totally new. So concretely speaking, uh, can, if you identify a ship in the middle of the ocean from space, you know it's a military craft, but you don't know its nationality. You're telling me that with Ceres, you will be able to tell the, the nationality of the ship. Yes, absolutely, because a, a ship has telecommunication equipment on board. They emit a specific noise, a bit like if you were listening to a whale under underwater, whale A is going to make uh, noises which are going to be different from uh, uh, whale B. It's uh, what we see with submarines. We have people, experts, in recognizing the noise made by uh, all the ships. 
Yes, we have a huge library of all the characteristics and features of radio stations and radars in the world, and that uh, makes it possible for us to say, okay, this ship is this nationality. Okay, that's what's going on in space. Now let's talk about the ground segment. A few weeks ago, at CNES in Toulouse, this is the room where we had a dress rehearsal, a very important one for the CRS program. This is the main control room for the uh, launcher. It's a very important room. It's only used for the satellite mission, for placing the uh, satellite in position. So this room is used to test the ground segment and to check the organization before the launch. When the space segment is composed with satellites in space, the ground segment covers all the means that are needed on ground. I'm in charge of the ground segment for the Ceres mission. This includes the control room so that we have visibility over the satellites. It also includes the orbitography center, which computes the positioning of the satellites, and also the collision analysis center that uh, triggers an alert if there is a risk of collision with other space debris. CNES is in charge of the ground segment part for the Ceres satellite. CNES was involved right from the beginning to define the uh, control ground segment and were in charge of positioning the satellites. When you launch a satellite, it's placed uh, on an orbit by the launcher, and then CNES teams have to take it on its final positioning so that it can carry out its mission. And then, during the entire life of the satellite, we're in charge of monitoring the operation of the satellite to maintain its uh, operational status all the way till deorbiting. De all this is operated by the Space Command, which is in charge of programming the satellite and collecting its data. Over the last few weeks, system tests, including dress rehearsals, have been quite numerous at CNET. You need to understand that we have various dress rehearsals which are carried out during the development of the project. The dress rehearsal is kind of a practice run for the teams to make sure that they are ready for the launch date. And in one of these rehearsals, we inject anomalies on the satellites or on the ground segment. We simulate problems to make sure that people know how they should react to such and such anomaly and carry out the proper actions, carry out the right analysis in order to ensure the proper positioning of the satellite. So these dress rehearsals are very important for CERES because this program uh, has many challenges for the teams. Yes, it's a multi-satellite mission, so we had to have a control room that was capable of managing three satellites in a coordinated fashion. They are interdependent. They fly information. It's also a very touching moment for engineers who develop these systems. Yes, we get involved in the project many years before the launch, so it's a bit of a stress, but it's also very moving. It's a great satisfaction to see the concrete achievement of everything we've done for many years. Okay, on board everything went fine, all the procedures were run smoothly. Once the rehearsals uh, are completed, the, the teams expect, uh, await for the launch with great impatience. What's um, very significant is the first acquisition. This is where we check the satellite and its status, make sure that all the equipment is functional, and once the satellite is in nominal position, we bring it from its injection orbit to the target orbit where it's going to carry out its mission. And that's for a few months after the launch. That's crucial before we can hand over the satellite a fully operational 
with such a light to the armed forces. Once all this has been validated by NES teams, the mission of CERES, operated by the Space High Command, will start. The leader of the CERES program is very dear to Patrick leloux rand CERES is a program for defense. It includes a large number of innovations. 20 years of work and 20 years of research. CNES is a partner of the Ministry of Defense and has been for many years. And it's great to be able to work in a national framework and to contribute uh, for the benefit of the Ministry of Defense. Philip Steininger will talk about the work of, our, of your ground teams, but just before that, we have a replay of the liftoff. Uh, so it was quite impressive. We have a brilliant sky. Let's take a look at the liftoff that took place 41 minutes and 46 seconds ago in Kourou, in French Guiana. That was at 6 o'clock in the morning in French Guiana. And they tell me that we have to thank CNES for these beautiful images. I think I know why. It's because it's um, the CSG, the Guiana Space Center, is operated by CNES. And these images are transmitted by the Guiana Space Center, therefore by CNES. No. Guiana Space Center, based in Kourou, from which we had uh, the Vega launch earlier, is technically and financially operated by CNES, and CNES coordinates all the launch preparations and also is also in charge of preparing the satellite. So it's thanks to you that you have these beautiful images. Well, for the Jupiter room, yes, you're right, it's managed by our colleagues at CNES. Okay. Beautiful images and a cloudless uh, sky. Yeah, that's uh, exceptional. It's a great privilege. OK, let's, I, 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 I love these, this video, but let's come back to what's going on uh, on the ground. CNES is a partner for the designing of the CRS program, but they're also involved in operating the, the satellite. So how many people were involved and will continue to be involved in the CRS program? This is what I was uh, saying before when I talked about the uh, CNES missions for the Ministry of Defense. And CRS is a major uh, program. And since we've had uh, military satellites, they've been operated by CNES and from the Toulouse Center of CNES when we talk about low Earth orbits, those are having an intelligence mission. But things are going to change, and as was said, the armies will take over, and CNES is currently training uh, military operators. Some of them are already operational and are included in joint uh, teams for special operations. These uh, joint teams uh, include CNES uh, engineers and uh, military personnel. So you'll work in cooperation. Absolutely. And to be more precise, at the moment, we are making, we are working a lot on the CERES program. So we have 150 people involved in the launch operation today. So we have our friends in Kourou, whom you can see on the screen, but also engineers who worked and developed the CERES program. People have a very accurate knowledge of the system and can contribute their expertise when need be. Uh, those who uh, deploy the global network of telemetry stations so that we can have a dialogue with the satellites. That uh, was shown in, in, the, in the video we just saw about the ground segment. Then you have specialists in orbitography and in-flight maneuvers. OK, so many teams, each having a specific role, absolutely each having a specific role to play. And then we have our teams based in Kourou. Sorry, we have some things happening 
in the flight and uh, within a few minutes we should uh, have visibility again that's very important um, DGA Hervé Grandjean we're talking about public stakeholders but uh, public stakeholders are working with private stakeholders yes in France our defense industry is very powerful very innovative very well structured many jobs in the in the, the industry of defense and in a program like the CRS program CNES cannot work alone so we find support from the industry who Airbus Thales they build the payload so the intelligence in the satellite that's going to listen and analyze the electromagnetic data and lots and lots of small and medium-sized companies who are subcontractors to the prime contractors Airbus and Thales Okay, we talked to Airbus Defense and Space in Toulouse, and we met with Jean-Marc Nastre. Listen to this interview. A few days ago, one of our journalists uh, went to Toulouse at Airbus Defense and Space to interview Mr. Naz, the executive uh, vice president of the French uh, industry. Okay, I'm Jean-Marc Naz. Uh, welcome. I'm in charge of space activity at Airbus. Serra's constellation it follows ELISA and S1 demonstrators. These are electromagnetic intelligence uh, satellites. It's very important for the armed forces. It's very important because that's the achievement of many years of work by men and women who contributed to this program. Today you're in Toulouse in the Palais site and for more than 30 years we've been working for the armed forces with military satellites. Since then the company has worked permanently as a prime contractor for all military satellites at the service of the armed forces. In optics with the SAMRO and ELIOS and then CSO satellites that were launched recently and will continue launching them next year, then the telecommunication with Syracuse and electromagnetic field with uh, S1, ELISA and now Ceres. So France is currently at the same level as all of the big players in space in the world, but it's because our investment in military space has never been reduced. What are the main field of uh, defense requirements? Well, the def defense requirements change at all time and at the moment no one can envisage any outside operations without space capabilities which are key for the operation of our armed forces so in optics we started with elios cso was launched uh, in autumn and will be launched next year the minister for the uh, of defense uh, already made an announcement for the optics satellite. We see the investments made by the Defense Ministry in the field of space, but the industry is also uh, ready to invest and to provide additional capability. After the spot Pleiad satellite that were paid for by the French government, we invested along with uh, uh, CNES for the CO3D um, constellation. We work on the OneWeb satellite with the operator and by doing that we gained expertise in the field of constellations and now we are a key player uh, with regards to the need that defense may have for low latency communication uh, capabilities we are a specialist in uh, defense satellites today and we can now play a big role alongside with uh, major nations in the world why is this important for the French industry well in space we have satellites that are getting very close to our own satellite, either to listen to them or to look at them. So we see that there is, um, let's say, unfriendly activity going on. The ARES program launched by our minister in 2019 is a major program to protect our assets in space, protect our assets on the ground, because our ground segments are potential targets as well. And we want to make sure that the, the means of France are always available when we need them. Of, of course, Airbus will be alongside the ministry for that. So why is uh, cybersecurity 
security a major topic? Well, cybersecurity is a major topic for everyone, for you, for me, with your laptop or your phone. But just imagine somebody takes control of one of our satellites, sends us wrong information, or destroys our satellite. Cyber criminality has no limits. So, of course, we do invest a lot on this topic. And right from the inception, our satellites are designed to be protecting against cyber criminality, both on the space and on the ground segments. More than 15% of our IT uh, budget is dedicated to the uh, protection of our assets against cyber criminality. But cyber protection has no limits, and we will always be working with our partners to make sure that uh, Airbus assets are the best protected in the world. Thank you so much. When we were watching this uh, report, a very important step uh, has taken place back to visibility and acquisition uh, by New Norcia. We have reached uh, the New Norcia station in Australia. The uh, mission uh, director just confirmed acquisition by New Norcia, and we are now downloading all the data stored on board. It so we were in the dark, then we are collecting all the data on board. Now they are collected, they are being analyzed right now, and we uh, can know whether the trajectory was the right one. This is already confirmed. We are at the right place with the right altitude. Everybody, everything is running smoothly. Now, what are the next steps? Uh, back to the mission. What are the next steps? We would think everything is done now, but it's not true. There are still many important steps. Yes, there are a few steps that remain. We were in a mode where there was a very slight rotation around the longitudinal axis of the launcher, the barbecue mode. We call that barbecue mode to spread the, the uh, sun rays everywhere. Why barbecue? Uh, well, the idea is not uh, to, to burn the, uh, the uh, satellites. Uh, like when you roast meat. So we are stopping the barbecue mode. That's what you're seeing in the animation on the screen. And we reorient uh, the launcher to reignite for the second time the avum uh, to uh, guarantee the orbit before a separation of the satellites, which is the step everybody is waiting for. Do we have time? for a few words about the AVUM, yes, and its specificities. What are the main characteristics of this upper stage that hosts three satellites? We see on the screen that uh, it's uh, the black part above the uh, AVUM that carries the three satellites. It's a structure that was developed specifically for the Ceres mission with two purposes. First, fit the three satellites in the fairing. It's a very small space. We saw on the integration videos that this is difficult to do. And then uh, separate the satellites, uh, the three satellites simultaneously, and then progressively uh, remove them from one another. It's a very important challenge. So from a technical standpoint, developing this smart structure that can simultaneously separate the three satellites was a challenge. Um, it's called the clip, and it's a mechanical separation. There is, there was propulsion, and then there will be a mechanical separation with springs, or is that too uh, commonplace? Now, we've had confirmation of the second ignition of the AVUM live. But to answer your question, yes, we are releasing the satellites and pushing them. And, and we control the thrust uh, thanks to springs that are adjusted specifically for that. We're going to see the separation in a few minutes. But before that, uh, we are going to hand over to uh, Daniel Andre, who is the launcher's uh, director at ESA. Freedom of action in space requires independent access. Independent access from uh, the European territory is uh, essential, in particular for security and defense payloads, whether we are dealing with recognition, intelligence, navigation, and positioning, or secure telecommunications. It is an essential contribution to the uh, 
geopolitics and strategy of the European continent. Tonight, we're launching Ceres on board Vega. It is a unique opportunity to demonstrate once again how much Vega and Ariane contribute to the uh, capacity of Europe to take autonomous action in space. Immediately after the launch, we'll uh, focus on the qualification flight of Vega C. Vega C, at a similar cost as Vega, will make it possible to carry payloads up to 2.3 tons and to double the volume in the fairing. So I'm waiting impatiently for the technical qualifications to be successful to start the flight campaign and launch Vega C to new orbits, which will be possible six months approximately after uh, this current uh, uh, launch. So we'll meet again in the spring 2022. Samuel Rogers, uh, you just gave me an interesting information. So the second avon boost was shut down. We've had confirmation of that. What is the next step? Next step, well, in, in a few, in one minute, a few orientation maneuvers before separation of the three Ceres satellites. Here we are seeing uh, 3D images, but they represent the actual orientations. And we're listening to the DDO uh, making uh, comments on this particular maneuver. Well, I forgot something that's very wrong. Well, uh, uh, Pépin Antoine Guillaume is commanding all these crucial steps and guiding us in this mission, telling us where we are. I forgot to say that. I'm sorry. I don't know whether I have the right time codes, but I think it's going to happen very soon now, this uh, separation of the satellites. Yes, in a few seconds. This is happening now. It's confirmed. Well, you can see it's always uh, very uh, moving. You want to watch the Jupiter mission control room. There are very nice images. You see all these people hugging and uh, celebrating, uh, whereas beforehand uh, it was uh, very quiet in there. Everybody has a little uh, teddy bear or, uh, well, an owl. Uh, in, in, <laughs> actually, uh, which is, uh, I think, representing electronic warfare. And it's very nice to see these images. It's not something you see very often. And you see the relief, the releasing of all the pressure and tensions and stress. So maybe we want to talk to them now. We don't know really whether we can talk to them now because they want to party and celebrate. All the teams are very happy. Uh, it's mission successful, successful mission. I think we can say it, even though there are some further steps uh, to accomplish but uh, the mission has been successful. I don't know whether Stefan Israel is available to say a few words. Usually, that's when we see him again at the beginning of the program and uh, after uh, the uh, success uh, has uh, happened. So let's continue watching these uh, very nice images. Uh, while we wait for Stefan Israel, we see people uh, doing checks and hugging. Uh, it's the result of many years of work and development. The program was launched in 2015, seven years of work almost. That is uh, ending today with a success. That's why all these people are so happy. And uh, it's uh, a success for part of the French defense policy uh, for the next uh, few years. Well, it, the, the uh, life cycle of these satellites will be about 10 years. There will be the next generation afterwards, but it's an important part of France's sovereignty that was just uh, uh, confirmed uh, to enable our forces to take action without asking for anybody's opinion or, or help. So we spent an hour and a half together. It's uh, an hour and a half that uh, represents seven years of work and the next 10 years as well. Now, we should uh, be able to talk with Stéphane Israel. He's online. Hello, Stéphane. Hello again, I should say. 
quatrième, vous avez le droit de sourire. So now you can smile. You're allowed to smile. Yes, hello again. So you can breathe again. Mission uh, successful. The mission was a success. Everybody around you seems to be very happy, of course. Yes, you know, you know that uh, each launch uh, requires a great deal of concentration. We uh, were waiting for this uh, separation. It happened now. We need uh, to perform uh, satellite acquisition, but Ariane has passed, uh, carried out its mission perfectly for the um, sovereignty of France. Uh, Hervé Canjon is here. France, Parley, I'm sure, is uh, watching us. We are very happy after Syracuse with Ceres to have worked for the uh, Ministry of the Armed Forces today and uh, for France's uh, sovereignty. We are all very happy on uh, the uh, set. Uh, Samuel Rogers uh, is happy as well as Hervé Grandjean and uh, Philippe Schellinzer. It's a very nice track record. Maybe a few words about uh, the uh, next missions, or maybe you want to add a few words about this one again. Well, allow me to thank our customers, the Ministry of the Armed Forces and CNES, greet our partners, the uh, uh, manufacturers of the satellites, Thales, Thales Anania, and Avio, which is our uh, prime uh, contractor for this launch. Uh, well, it is a European partnership, and I wanted to congratulate everybody for this success with Ariane Espace teams. Well, now can you tell us a few words about what's going to happen in the next weeks and months? There are several missions that are under preparation, I believe. Well, you know that uh, it's a very important year for Ariane Space. 15 launches, uh, Galileo will be the next one on December 1st on Soyuz James Webb on December the 18th. You know that uh, it's a huge responsibility that was entrusted to us by NASA, that uh, entrusted one of the major uh, projects, uh, the uh, um, telescope and then a one web launch on board so used from Baikonur and uh, well thank you for all these uh, clarifications and for uh, your time the dates that you have given are now penciled in our diaries we will be with you to follow these launches uh, thank you Stefan have a very nice day and enjoy this success there is still acquisition to be done of course but I'll let you enjoy the day back to the, the stage and the set uh, well uh Yes, Stefan uh, can be happy, of course, because uh, uh, the Ministry of the Armed Forces is really taking a big leap ahead in terms of capabilities with this morning's success. will be more accurate, will be more autonomous, will be better able to, uh, to assess the military situation. It will help us in uh, assessing the geopolitical situation of the world. And I'd like to thank CNES teams and the industries, Ariane Espas, the satellite manufacturers and their team. Uh, we owe this success to them. Now, when is it going to be operational? Uh, during the first half of 2022, uh, uh, well, there will be a new stage after the acquisition of the satellites is performed. It's called calibration to make sure that satellites are listening properly and transmitting the information to the ground. And once all this has been checked, uh, we will be able to use them not really as a weapon, but as a, an intelligence uh, tool in a few months. Uh, Philippe Schellinger, what are the next steps for you? We saw during the program that you will need to manage the operational aspects of these satellites. Well, as Hervé Grandjean said, during the first uh, stage, we'll check that the satellites are functioning properly. We'll do this in the next two weeks, and then we will have to uh, uh, constitute the formation of the Ceres system. You've seen that the three satellites are injected on one plane only. In the orbit, we'll have to place them on two planes. It should take us about three months, and we will constitute during these three months the final uh, formation of Ceres with a great degree of accuracy. I think that uh, in a few uh, moments we'll be able to talk with one of your colleagues. Can we call him a colleague of yours? Michel Sayek, Michel Sayek who is a general armament engineer at DGA. I don't know whether he's already with us. He's listening to us. He's, can he hear us? And next to Ms. Michel Sayek, we'll have General Friedling, who is the 
space commander within the space high command. Hello, gentlemen. Starting with you, Michel Sayeg, thank you for joining us. One word about this launch, what it represents for DGA and for you. Well, a launch is always a wonderful moment. I was here three weeks ago for the launch of Syracuse, and uh, we've been saying it for an hour, but it's a technological prowess, really. And the armed forces have been uh, expecting that for quite a long time. On the DGA side, it's, uh, we are all celebrating the success of this mission with the Vega launcher. And by the way, congratulations to CSG and Aryan Space teams here. But for us, it's just a beginning because uh, CNES teams and the space defense teams uh, and uh, our information technology center based in Rennes, they will work to make sure that our three satellites are properly deployed and start operating. Thank you. Michel Sayek, can you hand over your mic to General Friedling because you were talking. I don't need to. Oh, you have a mic, General. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, uh, Michel Sayeg. General, General Friedling, you are commander within the Space High Command. Um, a few words uh, about this launch. I guess it's a very important step for you too, isn't it? Yes, it's a crucial step for us, and it's a wonderful success. It's a double success. It has been said already, but we need to say it again. It's a technological and industrial success. It's a major success. We have the first and unique space uh, uh, electromagnetic intelligence system in Europe. It's a success for us. It's a success for our strategic autonomy, because thanks to this system, we'll be able to detect and characterize all electromagnetic signals that would be a threat to our operations and to our cap capabilities. So this will be done by the military intelligence services. We will collect these signals. It's a collective success. It's a team success. And on behalf of the uh, High Commander of the Armed Forces, I want to pay tribute to uh, CNES, DGA, Aryan Space, the various industries involved, and of course, the uh, Space High Command Center. Yes, General Fridling, just to your right, if, and Michel Sayeg, um, what are the next steps? We talked about this uh, briefly with Hervé Grandjean and Mr. Stalinger, but what are the next steps for the three satellites? Well, we will start calibrating each satellite individually because we need each of them to be at the top of their performance so that the sum of the three uh, meets the requirements of the armed forces. And then the three satellite, the, 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 the CNES teams will fine tune the positioning of the three satellites on two different planes so that within a few months, the Space High Command can start using uh, this, the Ceres satellites. So during the first half of 2022, we won't say more. Thank you both for being with us, for joining us. If, if I may, if I may, I'd like to add one thing. I'd like to underline the fact that this launch occurs at a very special time. We've renewed all, we have renewed all our uh, space defense capabilities in three years because we've renewed the optic part with CSO-1, CSO-2, Cirrus Q4 was launched a few months ago, and next year we'll have uh, CSO-3 and Syracuse 4 b So that's evidence, if need be, it's evidence that the space is a priority for the Ministry of Defense, and that will enable us to have crucial information which are crucial for our strategy. So we turn towards the future because we are working on the successor of Ceres. It will be called Celeste. And there was an announcement by the Minister of Defense. And we're still looking uh, towards the future. 
because the future needs to be built. Okay, thank you very much indeed. It's 7.30 in Guyana. I will let you enjoy the end of the morning, maybe have breakfast. But thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Hervé Grandjean, spokesperson for the Ministry of Defense. Uh, I'm looking at my notes, sorry. Philip Steininger, you are defense advisor for the CNES CEO. And Stefan Rogers for Vega launchers at Ariane Space. Thank you for being with us, for sharing your expertise all along this launch. I hope we'll have the pleasure of working with you again, because, of course, defense and space are two key uh, topics. Thank you all. Thank you to all the teams in Kourou. Road to Space will be back on, Jan on December 1st. Uh, with other experts, other videos for the liftoff of the Soyuz launcher with uh, the Galileo satellite. See you very soon, but before that, let's take a look at the sky. There are things going up up there.